Hello operating systems people, this is Gabe Parmer and today we are going to be talking about file system implementation and specifically indexing in file system implementation. <clears throat> so last time we talked about a number of interesting things for instance um, the abstractions and the interfaces that we should actually use to interact with stable storage. That included things like read write using file descriptors, it included things like open CREAT using the path um, interface that we have to our hierarchical file systems. This is a decent API that has kind of stood the test of time for accessing um, our persistent storage. So the question is, how do we actually implement that? How do we make these abstractions efficiently interface with the hardware in some way? Remember, operating systems are about, yes, providing those abstractions, but then again, interfacing with the hardware and multiplexing it in a good way. So the big question here is, can we do that by interfacing with the hardware to best utilize its throughput, latency, and to minimize fragmentation, right? So I'm going to start by talking about disks. Disks are somewhat antiquated, but they're an interesting test case for a lot of what we're going to be talking about, and they still are very important. We will talk a lot about SSDs next lecture, um, but for now, disks. So on the right, you see kind of an artistic rendition of a disk that has a spindle that has three platters on it, and within each of those platters, there are concentric tracks um, and each of those tracks, as you see on the left, is composed of a number of sectors. So we have a number of tracks, and each of those tracks with a number of sectors, each of those sectors is a unit of um, I.O., a unit of input-output. Normally, they're 512 bytes, and we can transfer a sector at a time using DMA um, to and from the operating system and main memory, right? And how do we do this? Well, there's an arm that has a head on it, and that arm moves between different tracks to get to a sector. This entire enclosure is spinning at very high rotational speeds, 72,000 RPM or something like it, so that the sectors are um, passed under the arm's head very, very quickly. However, the arm must also seek um, across the entire disk, which is what you're seeing on the left here. This is essentially the arm moving the head onto a specific track, and then the rotational um, aspect of the disk actually gets us to a specific sector, right? And this is real. This is a picture that you can see of an actual head on an actual disk. You'll notice there are multiple heads, one per platter, so there is actually some parallelism within the hardware where we can be reading multiple sectors at exactly the same time. Um, this is moving parts, and moving parts wear out and are unreliable, um, but as of now, disks are much easier and cheaper to produce very, very large, right? So they can be in the hundreds of terabytes range, which solid state disks cannot be. So when we think about magnetic media, we typically want to abstract the unit of I.O. into something that the operating system can find useful, and this is usually about a page size. So we think of a block size, which is the unit of transfer to and from the disk, as being effectively a page size. This is convenient because it allows the buddy allocator and the operating system to track everything effectively as pages as the smallest unit. <coughs> Um, the disk provides an abstraction to the operating system whereby it effectively is a 1D array of these blocks. So on the right, you see the teal array. That's effectively the array of blocks that we think of as composing the disk. So if we want to access the 12th block on a disk, we're effectively accessing the sectors corresponding to that data. Um, an interesting thing is a disk can usually process many I.O. requests in parallel, which means that we want to send them many requests all at the same time, even before we get one of the replies. Now remember, disk can be very, very slow, um, so this allows the disk to be intelligent and try to handle multiple requests at the same time. So the picture on the bottom shows us where we might make four requests to the disk, um, queue them up, and then um, at some later point in time, we might DMA a couple of the requests. It might not even be the first two requests. Um, at some point, the disk may send an interrupt saying that those, um, that data has been DMA'd, then it might satisfy the other two at some later point in time. 
So it pays to be able to make multiple parallel requests so that the disk can best use its um, head. So essentially, if we make four requests and the head needs to seek, maybe it can seek over all four of those requests in one sweep of the head instead of having the head bounce all around. So having this parallelism is very useful. As I said before, disks are really, really slow. So it's about nine milliseconds um, to seek to uh, arbitrary blocks. So on average, it's about nine milliseconds to seek to a block on the disk. And that's kind of veritable infinity as far as kind of your operating system and your CPU goes. And even the rotational latency on average is between two and 5.5 milliseconds for a lot of kind of common, you know, disk rotational um, speeds. And the nice thing about rotational latency is that it can access many different sectors along the way. So if it's rotating on one track, you can actually very quickly access all of the sectors it um, goes over. So you can actually get relatively high throughput that way. And I just want to compare these 9 milliseconds, 2 milliseconds to the 0 0.0002 milliseconds to access memory and the 0 0.00001 milliseconds to access registers. So the order of magnitude difference between all of these things is uh, ridiculously large, which is to say disks are slow, right? So one way that we think about this is that we kind of want to just minimize the frequency of disk access, and we'll get into some techniques for that soon. They're also very complex, so <clears throat> they're not just slow, but the way that you can get faster performance from them are relatively complicated. So seeks between cylinders is very expensive. Moving the disk head is very expensive. We kind of saw that with the nine milliseconds latency. What this effectively means from a programming perspective and from the operating's perspective that is that we want to have sequential accesses to blocks on disk where possible rather than random. Random means kind of accessing all around the big array that is the array of blocks on disk. Um, sequential means accessing one after the other, right? So this essentially says we want to optimize for spatial locality because the disk itself has extreme spatial locality. Um, if we just rotate, which is asking accessing the blocks that are contiguous to each other, then rotation is fast. If we need to seek, seek is slow. Um, so sequential access on um, one of these disks. This is old data, but I think the order of magnitude is all that really matters here. Um, this sequential access uses platter rotation, and we can see that we get some bandwidth and some latency. However, if we access random blocks across the disk, then that's a lot of heavy seeking and when the head needs to seek we have a couple of uh, orders of magnitude slower bandwidth and a couple of orders of magnitude higher latency so this is really really not good so as an operating system we want to figure out some ways to maximize sequentiality on the disk having contiguous blocks accessed all at the same time while minimizing these random accesses so what does this effectively look like in pictures? Um, we can see if the head is kind of near uh, a range of blocks that we're going to access, then and we're going to access multiple sequential blocks all at once, which is the darker teal blocks here, um, then that's going to be contiguous accesses with very few seeks. This is rotational latency and therefore faster. However, on the other hand, if our head is somewhere and we need to access a whole bunch of blocks that are spread out a bunch, um, this is a effectively called random access. Um, these are far, not contiguous, and this uses the secret latency, which is to say, again, two orders of magnitude less effective given the physics of these disks. So the goal of the operating system, maximize the spatial locality and block accesses by trying to make sure that we access contiguous blocks before um, others. Now, remember I said before that magnetic media is just slow, just comparing these different um, high-level latencies. So what we really want to do at a high level Level. Yes, we want to use this dis intelligently, but we'd really like to be able to minimize just being able to go out to disk. If we don't need to go out to disk, that's the fastest disk access, right? Um, so we operating systems typically optimize um, thoroughly for the uh, notion of caching. 
And caching is really just this idea that we can hold a lot of the disk's data um, on in memory and therefore access it in memory rather than on the disk. So we talked about the virtual file system layer. I didn't call it that, the VFS layer. This is just the generic polymorphic interface that we talked about for read, write, open, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so we have that VFS layer and um, we think of an operating system as being layered in some way. So for all of the path operations like open, create, um, unlink, etc., we have D entries. And we saw those last time in um, the picture. These are directory entries and are effectively our memory data structures that show the organization of the directories in the file system hierarchy. So if we need to look up anything with a path, we obviously want to look up in that data structure that looks like our hierarchical file system, right? Um, however, for the other operations that access file descriptors, you could think that, that those like read and write, they would just go out to the disk directly, but they don't. Instead, operating systems have a buffer cache, which actually caches the disk data. So if we read data from the disk, then temporal locality would tell us that we'll probably access that data soon thereafter. Spatial locality means that if we access one of the blocks in, I'm sorry, one of the bytes in one of the blocks, we're likely to access a few of the other bytes in that block as well. So we read the blocks up into what's called the buffer cache and keep them there. So we actually commit a fair amount of memory on all of our systems to holding file system data so that we can access it when we execute reads, right? <clears throat> okay. Um, if we go into the D entry, and we do not find the specific directory that we're looking for, then we'll also go out into the buffer cache. So the buffer cache is used in both cases. So if we are doing a read and trying to get data from the file system, we'll look in the buffer cache. If it's there, great, we just return it immediately. We don't need to make a disk request. If it's not within the buffer cache, then we need to go out to disk, bring it into cache, and return the data to the, um, the read call. For write, if it's not in the cache, then we are trying to write to data that's not in the cache. We just need to figure out how to update it on disk. Um, if it is in cache, then we want to update that file data in memory and update it on disk. But there's a question of when you should update it in, on disk in both of these cases. And that's actually a very difficult question to answer. Um, and the big question here is kind of, you know, you're, you're updating the disk, the, the disk data, your files, but what happens if the power goes out, right? The power go, if the power goes out before it's written to the disk, then when you boot up again, it won't be on disk. So that data is in a sense not committed out to the stable medium, the non-volatile medium, the disk. So there's this question of, should the process be allowed to proceed with this computation until it's been written out to disk? We'll talk about this in a couple of lectures when we talk to about crash consistency. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, we're gonna answer a few of the major questions that we have when we're trying to implement file systems today. <coughs> And we're going to focus mainly on something called indexing. And this is mainly answering the question, how can we track where different files are stored on disk, where their data is, where directories are stored on disk, um, and how we look up files and directories within directories. It also has to do with where we actually, um, how we track free space on disk to satisfy different allocations. <coughs> And of course, when we're creating these indexing structures, um, there's a question of essentially how we can do so while kind of optimizing for the physical characteristics of the disk, which is to say we want kind of the sequential access um, above all. So first thing that we do is, of course, create the notion of files. Files are, of course, an abstraction. Um, and files are, of course, mapped onto disk blocks. And a file is a logical unit of storage. So it's a array of bytes that goes from zero up to some maximum file size. Every file system does have a maximum file size, a maximum directory size, etc. So we think of the disk as this big old array of bits that is zero to some very big value. Well, files are also logically something that goes from an offset of zero up from there, right? 
Now, of course, there are many different files on disk, so different files are laid out onto the, the disk in different locations. And this is kind of like how we thought about processes having virtual memory, right? So they all have their own virtual memory. They think they're contiguous. They think they have their memory from zero up to whatever. Um, but re really what happens is that we map that onto physical memory in some way. So kind of the same thing. We think of each of these files as being logically contiguous, but the file system needs to map it onto the disk in some way, right? So it's a similar to the virtual to physical translation that we do, but instead we're mapping from a file and file offset to a block and a block offset. <clears throat> the main data structure that we use for this that is pretty uniform across most Unix variants, so Linux has this the same as XV6, is inodes, which stand for index nodes, or, I mean, there, there are people who say it stands for other things. I, it's most useful, I think, to think of it as an index node. And uh, there are inodes for files and directories. There tends to be a single inode structure in the system, and it's either a file or directory, which you can tell usually by a type within the inode. You can see this in the XV6 source. Um, and both the file contents and the directory structure, the directory information, are stored as file system inodes. So this includes not just the metadata, including things like permissions, the name, stuff like that, but also the data, right? For directories, the data is essentially an array of all of the things, the file system objects inside that directory. Uh, but for a file, you know, the data is actually the file itself, right? <coughs> Um, so inodes are actually something that is in memory and on disk. So usually you can kind of read in an inode from the disk, and it doesn't obviously have pointers that you can dereference, but it does in some way have reference to other blocks on disk. Um, and you can access all the structures within these inodes directly within memory. Um, so inodes are something that are stored both on disk and in memory. <clears throat> Excuse me. Each inode does have a unique identifier, and this unique identifier is often kind of the disk block that that inode is stored in, or many times in many older uh, file systems, including probably some that we're actually using, um, include just a region of the disk that is a big array of inodes that we use, in which case the inode number is kind of the offset in that array for the inode that you're using. Now, so I just want to emphasize here, inodes really are kind of both an in-memory and on-disk data structure, where, and um, because they can exist both on disk and in memory, the pointers within them are kind of a logical pointer to another inode. That might be another inode number, and then the file system needs to know how to access an inode at that number, um, or it could be kind of a block on disk. But regardless what it is, inodes are essentially kind of this unifying data structure that spans between um, disk and memory. So we saw this picture before. The light gray things are the D entries, directory entries, and these kind of correspond to the in-memory data structures that track the hierarchical file system. So there's an entry for each file, each directory, and you can imagine kind of like it is a tree structure. There's a link list for all of your siblings, there's a link for your parent, there's a link for the children, etc., etc., right? Um, in Linux, this is a big hash table, you know, it, it gets complicated. Um, when we open files within um, processes, we create these struct files, and those are um, corresponding one-to-one -to, -one to the file descriptors that we have, and they essentially point to the file or directory that we're actually accessing. Um, but now we see on the bottom right, we have inodes, and each of these file system objects, the directories and files, have an inode associated with them. So to actually get these light gray nodes into the system, we will have had to DMA them in, each of their inodes in, to memory. So now we have an inode associated with each of them and these directory entries. We have a directory entry in addition to an inode because the inode can't have just raw pointers inside of it to track things like a tree structure that we manipulate as a memory data structure. So we have the D entries to essentially be able to track all of that, and a D entry usually has a reference to the inode that it corresponds to. 
So often when we're walking through a directory hierarchy, we need to find the inode for, um, let's say we're at root. We need to find the inode for home, bin, and root, DMA them in. Once they're DMA'd in, we create the D entries for each of them, and then we can kind of walk through the file system hierarchy from there. So you can imagine that this is getting expensive because we need to walk, the, we need to ask the disk for all of these inodes, wait for them to come in, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we find them in the buffer cache, but if we don't, then we're, we're operating at disk speed. So again, this motivates the fact that we have struct file that bypasses needing to do this path checking every single time we walk through the file system instead we just have this reference to a file. <clears throat> okay, now we have two different types of inodes. Really, again, there's only one struct inode in most systems, but there, it kind of has two different types, so we'll go over both of them. Um, one of them is uh, holds directories. Now, um, di directories um, are effectively trying to track where all of the inodes of the children of that directory are. Which is to say, when you do an ls and you see a whole bunch of files in directory, those are effectively kind of the children within the file system tree, right? So a directory inode simply wants to figure out how to track those. So it needs an index, and we're going to be talking a lot about indexing, and that index essentially is a function from the directory inode that we're actually trying to look up information in. Um, and the nth entry, the nth file system within that directory, if let's say we're iterating through that directory, we look at the nth thing in that directory, file or directory, and it will return the name of that file, the inode, stuff like that. So this is what we want. We want an index that can provide us that mapping to find each of the things within the directory. So looking at the middle teal picture, we can see that a directory inode is at least logically laid out to have a number of um, name inode pointers um, within it. And again, these aren't necessarily real pointers in memory because this is a directory inode which exists on the disk itself. So they're references to one of the other inodes in the system that is within this directory, right? So this is able to answer questions like where is the 256th file or directory within the, this current directory that we have the dir inode for um, of the bar directory, right? Now, what's really interesting, of course, is that this directory inode, it typically has, except for root may be different, but it typically has um, some kind of pre-canned entries in that. So, of course, it has dot, which refers to itself, and you can see that that's a logical pointer to its own inode. Um, and then for dot dot, that's kind of a logical pointer to its parent inode. And then we might have foo and bar, which might be files or directories within this, um, and we have references to load. So when we're walking through a directory, all that we're doing is trying to find these other inodes to get more information about them. And each of these inodes we might need to go out to disk for. A file system tracks essentially how to do this, how to track all of these entries of the inode and how to go out to disk for that inode, right? Okay, so the inodes that are of type file that essentially track files, um, what they're trying to answer is, you know, read and write style requests, right? So the indices for file inodes are essentially trying to map a file inode um, that we probably have in memory and an offset within the file to uh, the block that that offset is on so that we can read it in and then you know, uh, uh, return the corresponding offset within that block. So again, these inodes are uh, stored on disk and interpreted in memory, and this effectively allows us to answer the question, where's the 50th block of the file foo.txt, right? The index within the file is meant to do that. So the big question here is, what do some of these indices look like? Um, so for directories, we know that we essentially have this big array of names and logical pointers to other inodes. For files, we know that we have this big array that holds the actual bytes for the file itself. So the big question here is, how do we implement this index that allows us to find these offsets into the contents of that inode?
So we're going to start out by looking at one of the simplest, but also in some sense, some, one of the most powerful indices. And this is a contiguous index. So in this case, a inode simply contains a um, logical reference to the starting block of the contents for this inode and the size in terms of the number of blocks that contain data for this um, uh, specific inode, be it a file or a directory. And what you see in the diagram on the bottom is that on the far left, we have a directory inode that holds all of the information about a directory. Um, in this case, it might be root. And you can see that it has dot, which is a reference to itself. It has a reference to foo. All of the dotted arrows here are references to the other inodes, whereas the... Um, um, non-dotted arrows are to data on disk. The teal nodes on disk are indices and the gray nodes are the actual data itself. So we can see that the foo um, file, or yeah, file in this case, um, that is within our root directory is at the certain inode at a certain offset onto the disk and we can see that its inode contains size information so we can see that it points to the start of the data for that inode and in this case we might have chosen a allocation style where we allocate the inode along with the data which is why you see the inode being contiguous to the data um, so in this case, we know that the data for that file is the four blocks following the inode. Um, you can see that there are two different files, bar and baz, um, within the file system, and they have different sizes, right? So this is contiguous allocation. It's basically allocating each of the files quite literally as an array, right? And you might kind of have deja vu when you think back to how we were allocating memory before, right? You might think, oh, I want to minimize external fragmentation. So I want to make sure that there are kind of large chunks of blocks in between allocations, not small chunks chunks of blocks. Um, for instance, at the very end of the disk, it might be hard to use that last empty block for anything useful, right? Um, <clears throat> but I want to point out here that this is a much more difficult situation than for memory. This is more difficult because each of these files might grow over time. If we continue to write to a file, it continues to grow. And if, let's say, the file foo were to grow quite large to the point where it wants to expand out um, to include where bar is, right, because bar is that second inode after uh, where foo is laid out. So let's say it, um, foo tries to expand another six blocks. Well, the six blocks would put it directly on to the bar um, index, so we can't do that. So in that case, we would need to actually relocate the entire file because it must be contiguous somewhere else on disk. This is extremely expensive and extremely complicated, right? Okay, but let's ask a number of questions about contiguous allocation. So, <coughs> the main questions that we want to ask are... <coughs> Man, I should have had some water before this. I'm so sorry. Um, the main questions that we want to ask are... Um, when we're accessing a file, if we were to access that file sequentially, which is to say we were to read from start to end or write from start to end, how does the file system behave? If we were to read or write from it um, randomly, how would it behave? Which is to say maybe we open the file and then try to read only the 400th block of it, right? Um, you can imagine kind of fast forwarding in a video to the middle of the video. You're just going to want to start reading halfway through the file, not the entire start, right? Databases do this operation quite a bit. Um, so we're going to ask, how, do, how does this index perform for random versus sequential file accesses? And then the question is, does this index map onto the disk in a way that promotes seeks or promotes rotation? Which is to say, does it work um, badly with the performance properties of a disk or um, well with the performance properties of a disk, right? Okay, so... Um, let's walk through these one at a time. 
So for file access, when we're accessing the file sequentially, it's very fast, right? We know that once we have the inode for a file, we know exactly where all of the blocks are for that file, so we can definitely read them in sequentially. And actually, it's even better than that, because if we can predict that we're going to sequentially read the blocks of the file, then we can actually ask for all of them at the same time, which is leveraging the parallelism of the disk. We're requesting all of the disk at the same time. So that will in aggregate be much faster. Um, if we're trying to access random blocks within a file because we're a database or we're fast forwarding through a file, it's also really fast because once we get the inode, we know where every block of that disk is. So no matter which one we want to read in next, we can find it relatively quickly. So for contiguous allocation, this is kind of amazing so far, right? Um, and then if we think of how contiguous is using the disk itself, it's laid out contiguously on disk, therefore, it's almost by definition using the rotational latency of the disk because it is contiguous blocks. Um, so it's very, very little using head seeks and prioritizing rotation of the disk, which means it's very, very fast, um, or as fast as disk can be, right? So contiguous seems to be killing it, right? Contiguous seems to be the clear winner, we're done, we don't need any other indices, right? But remember what I said, right? Um, the difficulty comes with how we allocate different files into our disk and how we grow the files, right? We're going to have to answer, have to answer the question, do we want first fit, best fit, all of that stuff. And unlike memory allocation, we might need to grow and shrink files. And we don't have this with memory allocation, and it makes this much more complicated. Because whereas a file might fit into a hole at one point, it might not in the future if it grows very large. So this means that we're going to have to spend a lot of time when we have a lot of writes to files that grow it, relocating files on disk, which might um, hurt the overall performance of the system quite a bit. And then, of course, we have fragmentation as a persistent problem, right? We will have external fragmentation as we try to allocate new files and... Um, of files of a certain size that can't fit into the holes in the file system. So this is why you have kind of defragmentation on old systems. Defragmentation was just the idea that we can actually put kind of all these files packed together um, so that we have a big hole at the very end of the system, right? Make a lot of more of those bigger holes. But um, this generally doesn't work. Just the, the need for fragmentation the need and um, the complexity with growing files means you almost never see contiguous allocation of um, files. However, it does have all these previous benefits, so we will revisit that next class. <clears throat> the second index that we're going to go over is kind of link lists, right? So here, our files or directories, our inodes are effectively, the data for our inodes are represented as link list of blocks. So now each um, block holds kind of some sort of a pointer, a logical pointer to the next block, often kind of an offset which block it is on the disk. Um, and then it holds data. So each of the blocks hold both some metadata where the next block is and the data for the file itself. So here you again see our root directory that points to foo. Now foo uses a linked index instead of a contiguous one. We can see that it still says that it's of a certain size of blocks, but it expects that we're going to point to the first block in the file. Then within that block, once we read it in, we'll be able to access the next block, then the next one, then the next one. And you can see it kind of jumps around on disk all over the place. And that's simply because... Um, you know, we, we just allocate the blocks one at a time. They could kind of be wherever we want them on disk. Now, <clears throat> this has a number of problems, um, but n not the least of which is that it's very, very hard to make parallel use of the disk, to have multiple pending requests out to the disk at the same time. You'll notice that if we want to read all the way through the file, to find the second block, we need to wait for the first block to come in. This means that we're only really going to have one pending request out to the disk for this file at any point in time. So that's going to slow things down quite a bit, right? This is one of the fundamental problems with linked allocation. 
Um, another fundamental problem is that we're storing this next pointer effectively within each of the blocks, so that way some um, space in overhead, probably not that much, like 2%, um, but it's not nothing. Um, we do not actually need to worry about fragmentation here. Um, fragmentation is, external fragmentation is not a problem because all of our allocations are a single block at a time. So it's kind of, you know, you're only going to fail an allocation when there's no blocks left on disk. You're never going to fail an allocation because there isn't a contiguous set of blocks large enough for your request, right? So this is great for external fragmentation. Um, but not that great for random and sequential access. So sequential is not great because we have to make these requests block by block. We cannot leverage the parallelism of the disk and have multiple pending requests to read all of the blocks for a file at once. We need to wait to get the first request back before we can make the next. And then random, I mean, it's bad for exactly the same, re the, the same reason. If we want to access the sixth block within the disk, we need to read through the first five before we can get to the sixth. So this is really not great for those reasons. For six versus rotation, that's actually, a, it's a little complicated and it kind of has to do, um, it's, intertwined with how you actually are trying to allocate the blocks within the disk. You could allocate all of the blocks to be contiguous for the specific file. Um, you still aren't going to necessarily make that much use of the fact that they're sequential because you aren't going to be able to make um, multiple pending requests at the same time. And because other files might be requested at the same time, this gets a little muddy. So... Um, it's a little um, sketchy whether we can actually use the rotation well of the disk, uh, but generally this is certainly not going to do it as well as the contiguous allocation. Um, and certainly if, as in this example, we allocate the blocks for the file all over the disk, then in no way are we promoting rotation. We have many seeks. So for block allocation, it's very simple. If we want to grow a file, it's very simple. We just allocate a block anywhere and we link it into the last block, right? Okay, the third index structure, we're starting to get more and more realistic here. Um, to be clear, all of these um, indices have existed before, um, but we're getting closer to things that actually exist within real systems. Um, and this one is a radix try, and a radix try is essentially a page table. This first example for index three is kind of a single level page table. So what we, oops, sorry. Um, I just went to the last slide. Cool. Um, okay. <clears throat> so here our inode for the file for foo is actually containing a array and that array points to all of the blocks of the file. So you can see why this looks like a single level page table. When we want to access anything within the file, we need to read in the index node, the inode, which effectively holds this array of all of the data, the array of all of the blocks. And then when we want to access a block within the file, we just figure out which block within the file it is, look up the corresponding index within that array, and retrieve the block data, right? So I think this is relatively straightforward. This is kind of a single level page table per file, per directory. Now, there are a massive number of questions that come from this low, right? Um, and a massive number of problems. So the first question is, what is the maximum file size of a system? And we start to see why I said before that there is a maximum file size supported by most file systems. And that's because the index node, the array within it, is going to have a maximum length. And based on that maximum length, you're only going to be able to access so many blocks within a file, therefore defining the maximum file size. You can kind of link these together, so combine these kind of one-level radix tries with kind of the linked allocation by having these different indexes, these different single-level page tables, um, linked together one after the other to basically make the files increase in size by linking the indices. Um, but nobody really does this. It's kind of just not worth the trouble because you kind of end up getting a lot of the worst aspects of links. Um, <clears throat> 
next question is how much space does this take up? Um, the amount of space it takes up is effectively the amount of size of the index. So there's kind of a trade-off here. You have a very large index that might be multiple blocks large. Your inode might be multiple blocks large, in which case you can have very large files, but now you have a multi-block index, so you're wasting a lot more space on disk because of it. So often you try to keep these things within a block, and that kind of limits how many files you're going to end up having. Um, but then there's the next question, and we asked a similar question for page tables. How many, then it was, how many loads do we actually make out to memory for a single logical load from your processor? Here is how many disk accesses do we need to ret retrieve data from your file? And we know that we need to retrieve the index node, and then we need to go out to the actual data itself, right? And we know that these are sequential. We have to access the index node and then any of the nodes within the file. It's not that bad compared to the other indexes that we've seen so far. That's fine. Um, in the question of does this optimize for seeks versus rotation, again, it's a little muddied. It's a question of can you allocate all of your blocks for the file contiguously on disk? And if so, then this is actually really, really good for optimizing for the rotational latencies rather than head seeks, right? So it works with disks relatively well um, because you can access all of those blocks after you have your inode. You know where every one of them is when you have your inode, and if they're all sequential, you can access all of them if you want. You can even access randomly within the file as effectively as the contiguous allocation because you can you can just look up the index within your um, the you can look up the offset in your index to find which block you're looking for, right? And you can also kind of have very good fragmentation properties, very good external fragmentation, because you can essentially do block by block allocation. However, if you aren't able to allocate a lot of the blocks for this file together, then you're starting to use more seeks than rotation, so there's certainly a trade-off here. Of course, when we ran into kind of the problems of, well, your index would be very large in page tables, or in this case, your file size would be very small, um, we kind of said, well, what can you do? Let's add multiple levels to our index structures. So we can have a multi-level radix try, which is kind of the analog of a n-level page table. So on the right picture here, you see that we have a two-level page table where our index points to another index, which points to the actual data node. And the question is, you know, as you go through this um, tree hierarchy, if you're at a leaf level, then you have data. If you aren't, then you have an index. And there's always a question of how what should n be? how kind of how large should your page table be here right and you can kind of see there's kind of a direct trade-off here if we have a deep um, uh, hierarchy we have a uh, and large n for multi-level then um, we can support very very large file sizes right and we get a lot of the benefits of a single level index. Random access is relatively fast, but we might need to go through multiple levels within the index structure. Sequential is very fast, you know, almost as fast as normal um, single level um, indexes. But we do have the additional complexity that we have to read in our inode, then we need to read in the second level of the index structure, then maybe the third, and then we can get to the actual data itself. And notice, as with kind of linked allocation, we can we cannot access all of the levels within that index structure all at once. We have to wait to retrieve one before we can request the next. So this does not use, um, not create multiple pending requests at the same time out to disk. So it's not using the parallelism of disk that well. However, once you do read in the index structure, everything becomes relatively quick um, and um, efficient. Okay, now the last structure that we're going to talk about is an exceedingly common one that's been used since kind of the beginning of disk-based file systems and is still used in ext um, 2 and 3, which is probably still used on some systems, some smaller systems. And the idea here is that 
the n-level page table structure, the n-level index structure, had the problem that we had to read through all of these levels, and that caused a large latency for us to be able to get the data initially. We'd have to read in that first level before we get to the second level before we get to the data. I really just want to read in my inode and then be able to get to the data immediately, right? So our index structure, our inode, will hold n direct references to data blocks. So a relatively small, n is probably small, um, direct references to data blocks. So we can directly go out to the data blocks as if we had a single level index structure. But then to support larger files, we'll have m indirect references, which is essentially kind of two level um, indexing structures. So each of these references refer points to a second level index structure that points to the actual blocks themselves. And then we can have X double indirect, where we essentially have another level in kind of the, the index structure. And then Y triple indirect, where we have another level. So each of these is adding more overhead. Um, we have to go through multiple kind of uh, levels within that index structure, but they're increasing the file size and most files tend to be very small. So we're using that n direct references most of the time so we don't have all of those overheads of the x and y um, double or indirection through multiple levels. And it's only when we get to much larger files that we have to have those overheads. So we, which is to say, we have a large file, we're going to have a lot of disk um, overheads anyway. So having disk overheads when we're already spending a lot to go out to disk is more acceptable. Um, the other thing is that most files are read sequentially from the first block onward. So what this um, combined index structure allows us to do is very quickly go out to those n structures while we're kind of pre-reading in the m indirect structures. So by the time we've read in n blocks from memory, we might already have that second indirection structure in uh, memory so that we can just directly go out and access it. So this utilizes the parallelism of the disk very, very well to hide the over heads of the different levels of indirection. So if we look at what this looks like, we see that the inode structure now has n references to direct blocks and direct data itself. And then we have m references that are two different index structures. Each of those index structures has a number of references out to data itself, right? And you can see that in this case, we don't need to go to the double indirect or the triple indirection um, nodes within the inode structure because the file is just not that large, right? So the combined indexing scheme is... Um, really kind of the best of many of the worlds. Um, it allows us to, by customizing lists, you know, N, M, X, Y, et cetera, and then how big each of the indices is that we kind of point to within each of those um, M, X, and Y um, structures. It allows us to kind of customize a little bit kind of how quickly we want to be able to access all of these things. The larger the value of n, the faster our sequential accesses to files will be and the more we can hide needing to get the indirection nodes, the different levels of the um, index structure. So this has many of the same properties for sequential accesses to the file as a lot of our indexing structures. If we are sequential sequentially indexing the file, then it's uh, roughly the same as having a single level index. Because by the time we're trying to read in the multiple level index structures, we probably will have already read in the, the multi-level index structures. I didn't state that well. Let me, let me restate it. If we're sequentially reading through the file, we're reading through n different blocks. And by the time we've read in those n blocks, we will have probably also read in the second level index structure, which means we can just continue reading data blocks. So this hides the, the 
multi-level overheads of the multi-level index structures while still having exceedingly large file sizes. So this is really good in that respect. If we're accessing random offsets into the file, then it starts to have a lot of the latency structures of having a multi-level index structure, right? Um, we can't hide getting the multi-level index structures from disk while we're getting the blocks from the N um, direct references. Um, so it suffers a little bit there. Databases are maybe a little, little less happy, but um, again, if they're already accessing so much data, maybe that's okay. The space overhead is actually not that bad as well. We, we optimize for small files, which means we do not need multi-level index structures if we only have n or fewer data blocks that we need to access, which is really beneficial. So this is a really common one, and this is what we're going to talk about most of the rest of the class as the index structure that's often used. We will talk about one additional index structure later on, um, but this is pretty much it for now. The next question that we need to answer is essentially how we track free space in the system. And this is not the same as memory. It, it is similar to memory in that we need to, um, when we create a file, um, when we, for instance, touch or echo to a file or something, we need to create it, allocate the inode, all of that stuff. But it's mainly on growing the file that we need to allocate blocks, right? Or adding more files and directories into a directory when we need to, to grow it. So it's slightly different than the malloc problem. So the question here is really how do we find free blocks to allocate when we need them? For contiguous, this is really complicated, but for the rest, maybe not as much. So I think the naive way to do this, you know, let's start with the dumb thing first, is just let's, let's do what we did for memory and just use um, a link list, right? So you, this is a free list. I'm not going to go into the details. We kind of already talked about this. So how much space does this use on disk? None, because the linked structure is inlined into the free blocks on disk, which are not used for anything anyway. Therefore, practically it uses no space on disk. That is the only good thing to say about this structure, right? Um, oops. Of course, I had to do that. Sorry, I don't know why my fingers are a little uh, trigger happy today. We've been through a lot. You've learned a lot. We're almost done. Okay. Um, so, if we want to allocate a block, we find it on the free list. We rewrite the head of the free list, which is actually writing out something to disk, which is pretty slow, um, but we can do it, right? Um, if we would need to find n blocks, we need to walk through n of these accesses to be able to kind of find n of these free blocks and then update kind of the head node on disk, which again is relatively slow. Um, the big problem comes if we want to find n sorted, or not n, not sorted, sorry, n contiguous blocks, right? That is really hard in the scheme. We kind of need to sort this free list to be able to do that, which is often kind of complicated in and of itself. Um, in short, this is kind of a mental exercise, but rarely done, right? What is often done is to use a bitmap at some place within the disk or multiple di bitmaps spread around disk um, to be able to kind of spread out the writes. Um, and these bitmaps include a one or a zero um, that corresponds to each of the blocks on disk. And um, here it's one if it's allocated, zero if it's not, right? So this actually does take up space now. We have a bit per block on disk, but that's like 0.001% of the, the disk is taken up by the bitmap, so we tend to not care. Um, if we want to access n blocks, um, we want to allocate n blocks, then we might need to read in all of the bitmap or uh, enough of the bitmap from disk to find that many blocks. And if we want, the really cool thing about a bitmap and why it's really so commonly used is because if we want to allocate n contiguous blocks or try to find, optimize for finding contiguous blocks on disk, then we can do that because that just boils down to finding contiguous bits in the bitmap, right? And this is exactly what 
bitmaps are relatively easy and fast for doing. So this is really important because if you think back to a lot of the indexing structures that we talked about, I kind of said that, you know, they can kind of point to blocks wherever they are on disk. If you allocate those blocks to be contiguous, then um, the index structure will be relatively fast. So it really comes down to using a free, uh, a, a, a free and allocation structure like libitmap that allows us to optimize for these contiguous allocations. Okay, last thing that I want to talk about, sorry for a little like, sorry for the length of this, um, is I just want to get some perspective here. So let's say that we have this file system structure, sorry for it being kind of ugly and compressed, and we want to open uh, the bar.txt file in the root directory in root, right? So we can see here a file system hierarchy, and we can see that that slash directory is actually a D entry and actually has an inode, okay? So the question is, how many disk accesses does it take to find the data um, at some offset in bar.txt, okay? So think about this for a little bit. This is a little bit of an evil question. It's worse than you'd think. Um, so that's why Penny is in her uh, Halloween variant. Think about it for a second, come back. Okay, so the general idea here is that first we need to find the inode for the slash directory. Um, then within that direct within that inode, we need to find the root directory within it. That might, if we have a indexing structure, um, require multiple block accesses on disk to find where that root entry is in slashes um, index structure. Right, so that might be certainly we need to get the inode, but then we might need to get additional blocks if we have an index structure that requires it. Okay, then once we've done that, we need to find the roots inode, so we need to read that in. And then within root, depending on the indexing structure that that directory structure, that that directory inode uses, maybe it's a multi-level indexing structure, who knows, um, we need to be able to look up bar the bar entry and find the inode pointer. Again, that might be multiple accesses out to disk. And then we need to read in the inode for bar. And then once we've read in the inode for bar, then we need to find the certain offset that we're looking for within that bar file. So even though we are simply trying to find this bar.txt file and something inside of it, there are a huge number of disk accesses that correspond to this. So for hopefully it makes a little bit more sense why we're kind of keeping these file structures around that just point directly to foo or bar um, and why we try to keep the buffer cache with all these inodes in memory and all the data in memory. Okay, so we talked about file system indexing today and the big question was essentially how do we find data on disk and how do we um, manage and um, organize data for directories and for files on disk. And we saw that this has a lot of trade-offs in space, in the sequentiality of different allocations, which maps to the rotational access latency of disks, um, and on whether we could have request parallelism out to the disk. So this effectively says that we want to form our index structures in a way that optimize for the physical um, disk characteristics. Next lecture, we're going to talk about very similar optimizations, but how it plays out not just for um, magnetic disks, but also for solid-state disks. Thank you very much. Talk to you soon.